Happy 2022 to all of my listeners on Eusebius on Times Live. This is a wonderful experiment we're starting the year with using a new platform, um, StreamYard, in which we are essentially recording live and interacting live with you, which I have been missing um, since I left talk radio. And although I love podcasting, the disadvantage of podcasting is that I pretend to be talking to you directly. But of course, I only know your thoughts after you've listened, not in real time, to the conversation. And today is very, very different because there will be multiple opportunities for you in real time to be chatting to me and to two of my wonderful guests. I'm going to introduce them in a second, but let me tell you what it is that this episode is about, the very first one for the year. Part one of the state capture report was released yesterday. Unless you are an absolutely brilliant reader or a speed reader, you're probably slowly making your way through the more than 800 pages of this huge first edition of the state capture report. And it deals thematically with a number of areas. It deals with South African Airways and some of the affiliate related state owned companies. From there, it segues into the new age, which is not, it turns out, a newspaper. And then lastly, it deals with South African revenue services. And across those three areas, we get an excellent evidential basis with which to begin the investigations into the men and women that have been looting from you and me and the public purse over the last 10, 15 years, longer, in fact. And the question is, was it worth it? the almost four years of the commission sitting with the incredible amount of public money spent on it. That is the question I want to investigate and engage you on. And there are a number of ways you can participate. If you want to join the conversation, post your questions or thoughts in the live chat panel on this YouTube video. You can engage with us live. You can find this video on the Sunday Times YouTube channel and add your thoughts and questions uh, to the live chat box and then my wonderful producer Paige will make sure that we weave your comments and questions into the discussion in real time, which is really exciting. I'm joined by one of my favorite um, journalists and I um, can't believe it's taken so many years for him and I to finally be colleagues, even though there are very few media houses and at some point everyone becomes with the Sunday Times. The Sunday Times is hosting this event with us as is Times Live. And a little bit later, I'm hoping, technology working, to be joined by Nicole Fritz as well, who has got an excellent new job. Um, she's obviously well known for her leadership within civil society organizations, but her latest role is at the Helen Sussman Foundation. They too have been credible vanguards in the fight against corruption for a more just South Africa. So once Nicole is online, I will bring her into the discussion. In the meantime, I want to say how's it to Sabella, who is all the way in the Eastern Cape, uh, but being the good sport that he is, he's agreed to be part of the conversation, even though we'd rather be on the beach sipping lattes. How's it, Sabello? <laughs> morning, morning, you be and morning to, to everyone joining us uh, on the various platforms. Happy New Year. <laughs> Thank you. Compliments, as they say. And um, can we agree, by the way, when do we stop saying that? I, I, I'm already tired of saying it. We need to all <laughs> have like a universal rule. When is the last day you can say same to you, compliments, Happy New Year? I, I think the first week of January is just about enough yeah. for me. I think as soon as you start putting kind regards at the bottom of the email, you should, <laughs> you should discard <laughs> the top of it with uh, compliments of the season. <laughs> so, Bello, yesterday was really important. I mean, it took an hour longer than was scheduled before part one of the state capture report was handed over. And I thought the important thing for us to do first is to really take in that moment. Um, and I want us to take in that moment and just really get your sense as a senior journalist in the country, as a South African, probably first and foremost, what the significance is of yesterday. That's a question I have for you. It's also a question I have for Nicole. And I think given that we're now getting into the substance, perhaps I can bring in Nicole at this point. Um, technology seemed to have worked wonderfully well. Nicole, thanks so much for joining us. Congrats on your wonderful role at the Helen Sussman Foundation. I am so delighted. Uh, Francis Antoni did a great job. You're going to do a great job. It is one of the country's best 
social justice institutions, not just the litigation work you do, and both your individual biography and that of your new place of employment um, is one that we are very proud of as South Africans. Thanks for joining this platform. Thanks. Thanks, Eusebius. I'm so delighted to be here and to join this discussion with Sabella. And thank you so much for the incredibly kind um, welcome. Uh, so I'm enormously happy to be here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Nicole, let's actually start with you instead of Sabello and get rid of this mantle between him and me. Take in the moment for me. Yesterday is critically important from an oversight and accountability point of view. How did you feel yesterday? A, as a South African first and foremost, and then secondly, as a civil society organization leader. Well, as you say, enormously important. Um, whilst it's not the culmination of the of the work of the State Capture Commission, it does result uh, it does represent uh, the first sort of final product um, of its work. Um, that you know has been a, a signal accomplishment. Uh, you know the um, the the flighting for this this particular show indicated that the um, commission has been going on for three years, over three hundred witnesses. Um, yesterday's uh, first part of the report indicated that it received over more than two, close to two million pieces of documentary evidence. Um, you know the, the the amount of material that it has had to engage with is is tremendous, um, and and so I think. Um, the production of this is a is a signal accomplishment. That said, um, that has to be tempered with a kind of sense of of, of sick horror um, at what it speaks to. Um, and and I think you know we we've many of us um, engaged citizens have been watching the testimony, um, know uh, the extent of the corruption and abuse that that has come to light. But I think having it represented in the report as it has been, um, having it carefully passed and analysed, you know, where, where people have spoken and disclosed the extent of wrongdoing, and then putting that side by side with mm. the supposed the, the perpetrators of that and their failure in, to, to answer. So that often it's just simple ball denial um, or the most um, uncredible type of response. And I think yeah. that type of presentation makes it ring so much more true, um, and I think, uh, you know, alarmingly, um, and I think, mm. as I said, sickeningly, um, when we think about how much um, is needed in this country to uplift Absolutely. so many, um, and and that money uh, that that money that has been taken that has been wrongly misappropriated yeah. from the public of South Africa, I think that can only leave us with a sense of sick horror. I couldn't agree with Nicole more, Sabello. I had discombobulated feelings. On the one hand, I thought to myself, the archiving of facts matter because you need a factual basis with which to legally hold the scoundrels accountable. And also the facts matter so that you and I can use the facts politically as active citizens, as voters, and decide what we want to do with those facts. And to that extent, I thought it was really important from a democratic point of view what happened yesterday. Yeah. On the other hand, I also thought, and I know you felt the same from our WhatsApp conversation this morning, that I really hope yesterday is not merely symbolic. We are very good at analysis paralysis in South Africa. And the true value of a commission of inquiry lies ultimately in whether or not it leads to genuine justice and genuinely repurposing institutions to again be fit for purpose. And so on the one hand, I recognize the procedural significance of yesterday, but I also, like Nicole, want to constrain my excitement by realizing that the hard work only starts probably from the end of February. How do you feel, Sabello? Yeah, I think um, it's the exact same thing, to be honest, you see, I think. Um, but for me, there is, you know, a little bit of uh, of excitement, you know, I think, you know, from a journalist's perspective, um, some of these things we've been grappling with since 2012, you know, and I mean, I don't need to tell you about the sort of anxiety that, you know, one often gets after you publish a splash. You know, people always imagine that you sit there on a Sunday, you know, satisfied with yourself. But another part of you is also sitting there and thinking that my word, you know, do I get the total context of what I've written? You know, have I actually maligned an individual 
um, you know, unwittingly. You know, you sort of think of those things. And then also for me, the big thing was, and I know this is not the end of the sort of comeuppance, but to see some of these individuals, um, because part of what gave them, you know, the credibility or legitimacy was the fact that there were no credible institutions that had said that what you've done here is wrong or you've, yeah. you, you, you know, you've bent the law, you were, out, you were outwardly corrupt. Um, now that you've got that, for me, I also feel that sort of satisfaction that even though this is not the end of it, um, it's at least the beginning. I mean, I remember the sort of disgust I felt when you were watching some of these people give testimony at the commission, um, the sort of arrogance that they met, um, the questions from the evidence leaders, you know, the sort of dismissive attitude um, they had to people's pain that they were being told that they had wrought on mm. them. I mean, I remember one of the cases where they kept an executive in the office for up to nine hours into the early evening because they wanted this individual to sign. You know, this guy was clearly distressed. Um, and when it was put to them at the commission, it was sort of like a whatever kind of thing. You know, so for me, yeah. on that level, I'm glad that it has happened. And I'm glad that South Africans have seen for themselves the horror that takes place in these people. Absolutely. But then I also do worry because a part of me also, you know, cynically thought that if I'm one of these implicated people, um, I'm actually happy now because for the NPA, given what it looks like, to get me before the dock, you know, to get me to sit again and feel the glare of, of that pressure yes. um, might not even be in my lifetime type of thing. You Absolutely. Know? So that's the sort of how we sort of should temper um, mm -hmm. our excitement with this. We, and we're going to come back to that. Lebohang and Lisa, I want to acknowledge your questions in the chat box. They're essentially the same and both want to know, will it take years before we see actual justice? Lebohang says, with all that's mentioned in the report, are we in for another long spell before there's action on the findings? Lebohang, we're going to address that question a little bit later. The same as Lisa's, how long before we see justice? I think that's very important. But before we do that, it is equally important that one stays with the detail. And despite being much maligned, civil society organizations like the Helen Sussman Foundation, as well as journalists and the media, we are the ones who will be reading the report, collating it. There's already some excellent work done, both by Arena um, Products, Times Live, Sunday, Sunday Times Online, but also our colleagues elsewhere, Daily Maverick, uh, New Frame, I'm sure will do a great job. Um, News 24, and and the detail matters. And my appeal to you as my, my listeners of this podcast is to really make sure that you don't get fatigued. After four years, you're entitled to be fatigued, but the scoundrels love it when you and I get fatigued. So why don't we talk about some of the detail a little bit? Sabello, let's start with theme one in the report. South African Airways, as well as um, SA Technical and South African Express, like so much within the South African state, had been hollowed out. And it always starts with a pliable chairperson of the board, like a Dudu Miyeni, and her proximity to the former president. It is just incredible how that enabled the national carrier to go from being proudly taking South Africans across the region, allowing for trade and commerce to take place and also for us to just be able to fly around the world and to carry South African citizens everywhere. And yet the report says things like, and I mean, I could, you know, there's so many, so many nexus moments in the report, but a couple of examples of, 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 of what the, the Deputy Chief Justice had found in relation to SAA. Quote, the evidence reveals that Ms. Mieni was appointed chairperson of the board of SAA in circumstances where she was an underperforming board member. She proceeded through a mixture of negligence, incompetence, and deliberate corrupt intent to dismantle governance procedures at SAA, create a climate of fear and intimidation, and make a series of operational choices at SAA that saw it decline into a symbolic state. And from there, Sabello, it goes even more granular and evidence tracking in detailing the ways in which SAA and associated affiliates were basically just stolen from. And I think for me, UCBS, uh, you know, one of the things that that granularity sort of brings out um, and something that we often, you know, sort of disregard is the role that is played 
um, by those companies, private entities that would do business, you know, with, with these SOEs. Um, we often get the idea that, you know, civil servants uh, sort of stuff money in a suitcase and walk out of it, walk out with it in these SOEs. But in actual fact, it's how they actually use the companies. And I mean, some of these companies are multinationals, the likes of Swissport, um, you know, which refuse to sort of give any proper... Um, you know, sort of cooperation to the commission. They didn't even produce a single, I mean, and, and I think the Deputy Chief Justice accentuates this in his report where he says not a single scrap of paper um, to justify any sort of relationship between themselves, um, a local entity called JM Aviation and SAA. Um, meanwhile, Swissport had basically benefited to the tune of hundreds of millions, including getting a hold of, you know, SAA's technical infrastructure for next to nothing, um, you know, through some of these deals. But it is for me really, you know, like you say, the effect that Dudumieni had when she was there. Um, the fact that she was able to meddle inside operations to the point of even defying institutions like the DTI, for instance, um, and actually even defying ministers. You know, one of the things that I think the report draws out quite nicely is that it draws a series of events um, before some of these cabinet reshuffles that we see um, to a point where you are now understand that even someone that was willing to be used by the Kuptas like Malusi Kikaba, um, when he could no longer um, sort of countenance how blatantly Mieni was operating, tried to sort of rein her in and he was removed and replaced with Lynn Brown. The first thing that Lynn Brown does when she gets there is that she gets rid of all these board members that had been petitioning uh, Kigaba to actually get rid of her. You know, the same thing then plays out again um, with Tantanene. Uh, Tantanene was standing between Tudumiene and what she thought was going to be, um, you know, tens of millions in success fees if she had delayed, you know, a swap deal with Ebas. Um, the delay of that swap deal deal ended up costing SAA 800 million rand in, in, in prepayments that it didn't have to incur, you know, for the delivery of aircraft. So, I mean, these are some of the things that once you look at, you know, the SAA that ultimately went into business rescue, you then understand Absolutely. how we got there and the role that mm -hmm. someone as politically untouchable as Durumiani had. Yeah. So two initial questions, Nicole. What's for you so far comes out of that part one, understanding the aviation sector and in terms of its looting? And then a sort of parenthetical question, in addition to that, how important is it, speak directly to the public, to really stay with the detail and explain why the detail matter, even if it can be mind-numbing? I'm um, sure. Well, one... One of the first things I want to say, and I think is brought to the fore um, in the, the the volume, the chapter on on SAA and its associated companies, again, is the the huge um, I think um, debt of gratitude that we as South Africans owe the media. So, for instance, the um, the chapter on SA Express starts with the disclosure made in Karen Maud's article in uh, the Financial Mail around what was happening in um, at SA Express, right, which had received very little attention as compared to what was happening at, at SAA and the state capture that was happening there. And so I think, you know, whilst uh, Eusebius, as you are emphasizing and underscoring the real work and the hard work starts now for us as, as a public, I think we also need to take the time to acknowledge and pay tribute to those who've allowed us to get to this this place. And I think that that is very much the kind of investigative journalist of this country, like Sabello. So thank you. Um, and to you, Eusebius, and to, and to your colleagues. Um, I also think what the chapter bears, bears out, uh, and when one was speaking to, speaking um, of uh, Ms. Mayeni's uh, malfeasance and the facilitators that she had around her, like Ms. Quinana, um, you know, and their uh, uh, their conduct was just brazen and and shameless. But I think sometimes we think, oh, you know, I mean, you know, corruption, uh, misappropriation of funds. I mean, yes, there are victims, but they're faceless victims. And I think what is important to also bear in mind is is the enormous number of individuals, and I think this is highlighted in the report, who actually did seek to resist. Uh, the efforts of those like Ms. Miani and Ms. Quinana Susabello. You've already spoken about that example of Mr. Dawa, where he was refusing 
to sign uh, the documents that um, he was under considerable pressure, hours long pressure from um, Ms. Mieni and Ms. Uh, Quinana to do. Um, and, and the threats that were issued against him, and not only against him and Ms. Msher, but several others within SAA employ, and that in fact, Ms. Mieni fabricated whistleblower reports in order then to undertake disciplinary processes against uh, various persons who were seen as thwarting uh, their, their attempts to engage Absolutely. in abuse and malfe malfeasance. And so we also have to recognize, I think, the direct victims of, of you know, the actions of, of the perpetrators of state captures and, and again, owe them, um, owe them a, a debt of gratitude. And we must, we must think about how we do that in a way that is meaningful and, and real mm -hmm. because we do owe them a tremendous um, debt of gratitude. And then the second thing, um, Yosubius, just in terms of, of why the detail matters, um, and we'll, we'll speak about uh, some of the recommendations, and they differ in their the degree of granular, granularity and detail, but there are a number of recommendations for prosecutions, and those are not necessarily just broadly formulated, right? They are, here are the individuals, specifically named individuals, and here are the types of charges that we are recommending be pursued, that they should be charged under these pieces of legislation. And you have then got all this this evidence in the report and then documentary documentary evidence underlying the report that can be um, obtained that is going to facilitate the those prosecutions um, and hopefully the obtaining of, of, of meaningful justice. And I think it facilitates our role as the public in, in tracking and monitoring the role of our criminal justice system and particularly the National Prosecuting Authority in moving through with those recommendations. So if the kitchen has been hot for the National Prosecuting Authority, and it has up to this point, it is boiling. And the expectation from the South African public that we should see prosecutions coming out of this report um, are exceptionally high and must be exceptionally high. And there must be all sorts of pressure. And we have the information to make that pressure meaningful. Mm -hmm. It is so interesting knowing what I want to do with this discussion and where the public headspace is at. And this is what I love about live interaction. A POS says, is there political will to realize the value of the commission and enforce justice? Or can the civil can civil society alone achieve justice? A POS, that's a really important question. There was another question from another one of our listeners and um, re readers of the Arena Holdings publications to the effect of, can you really trust the president to do his job in terms of go, go, running with the recommendations when there are so many underperforming ministers that are still running ministerial positions, Blade, and Bucks, Pravin, et cetera, who's fooling who here? And that is from Nozipo Mboweni. And I want to come back to those questions. But what's interesting about those questions is the public is baying for justice and consequence management. And I'm trying to slow down the public by saying, We'll get there, guys, but it's first important to understand the beast. Um, and I think maybe in five minutes' time, I'm going to have to be led by the public on where this discussion goes, because my thinking was, unless you understand the nature and the scope of state capture, you can't begin to come up with what the right interventions are. It's the same with any kind of problem solving. You need to know that the problem exists, how big is it, what is its nature, before you can storyboard a solution. So I know that as the public, as South Africans, we want to know where to from here. Can the Helen Sussman Foundation alone do something? Can Section 27 do something? Can Equal Education do something? But before we can even answer that question, we have to come to terms with understanding what we are dealing with. So I want to spend one or two more minutes just unpacking the nature of the beast, Sabelo, because as I'm listening to Nicole, I'm thinking to myself, the other thing that's important about volume one, part one of the state capture report is that Dudu is not a lone ranger. Yeah, We see Dudu intentionally being propped up in the hollowing out of SAA by, for example, the state security agency, by internal auditors. And that nexus makes my blood boil in the same way in which Nicole was describing in her taking in the moment feelings, just how horrific the report actually is. I want you both to speak into that because there's a difference between inflating an invoice which is let's call it low grade corruption. corruption and higher grade corruption 
where we go from inflating an invoice to actually repurposing institutions so that we are fundamentally subverting the entire democratic edifice. And when I think about the detail of the horror of SAA, we're not talking about individual actors, we're talking about an entire system that has to be understood, which is why the concept of state capture is a distinct concept and very different from mere corruption. Sabelo? So, and that's exactly the point, you see, because for me, it's, it's the network, right? I'll give you an example that's contained in the report. So one of the things that happens almost immediately after, you know, the board that was led by Cheryl Carolus um, is removed um, by Malusi Kikaba, the minister. Um, the new chairperson um, of the board, uh, Vuisi Lekona, who then also comes in as acting CEO because they had managed to sort of chase out uh, the CEO who was resistant um, and then chase out some of the all of the board members when they resigned you know so the new board comes in and then immediately that chairperson then becomes the ceo one of the first things it does is that he visits the gupta compound um for the meeting and with him is none other than the minister's advisor and they sit in this meeting um you know and certain inducements are made of this gentleman and i suppose and i mean i can't even speculate why he sort of you know turned them down but he turns them down and then he happens to mention this meeting to to do me any um, there's another confrontation with the minister and then, you know, the advisor comes back to him and says, you're compromising the mission, you know, kind of thing. And I think for me, and, and I think for, for, for me specifically, because I reported on some of these things, it then wove a complete picture of just how this thing worked, you know, how they actually utilized, um, you know, senior executives, you're talking about, you know, the, the acting CFO, Pumez Ananti, that they brought in there. Um, and then they induced her to do and make decisions that even she wasn't fully aware of, but now appreciates that people were looking to benefit. And these were people that were inside SAA. Um, you know, you look at the role that was played by Yaka Quinana, for instance, um, you know, in sort of pressurizing. And I think at SAA, the most interesting thing was that they almost used, you know, senior positions as sort of like a dangling carrot. So they would have Tulim Chair there as acting CEO. And then they thought that by the mere fact that you are now acting and you probably receive an acting allowance, have now changed your life a bit, probably bought a bigger car, you know, move your kids to a better school, that you would do everything in your power to sort of fight to stay there, which is where the inducements sort of come in. And I think for me, another interesting thing that, you know, I think as time comes, we'll, we'll see about Tudumieni is when she says, Pumeza Nancy claims that she says, um, you will never find my signature in any of these things because I'm too clever for that. But I will instruct you guys so that you guys are the ones that have the signatures, you know. So I think for me, as it is important for us to sort of, you know, um, honor the whistleblowers and the guys that resisted and didn't Absolutely. want to, to understand the machine and to understand how it works, we also need to focus on those that became pliable. And they followed mm. instructions knowing that they were wrong. Mm. Because my one worry, Eusebius, is that a lot of these individuals are still within these SOEs, you know, which is why you can still see sort of, you know, puzzling decisions being taken at Prasa, you know, some other dodgy decisions being taken at other SOEs, because you still have a caliber of civil servant in South Africa um, that, depending on who the boss is and what their agenda is, will follow but then yeah, we'll keep quiet when it comes to a moment yeah. like the Zondo Commission mm -hmm. where you are supposed to disclose. So for me, I think it, 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 it sort of, as I was reading it, it brought up other things. I was saying to you earlier that, um, for instance, the attempt to get rid of a senior official in the finance department at SAA by claiming that, you know, she was a dual citizen um, and they had used the SSA to do a vetting process unlawfully mirrors what actually happened at Prasa now, you know, where Absolutely. the... The chief executive officer was summarily dismissed because um, he had not disclosed that he also... 100%. Bruce, yeah. You know, then you find yeah. out that actually, in actual fact, before all of this happened, the CEO had started saying no to certain things that politicians up to the level of the minister um, were basically instructing be done. Nicole, I want to speed it up just because I am letting the public produce this and they want us to talk about politics and about whether we've got any faith in the institutions of justice. So despite what we had planned, that's going to be our focus for the last 15, 20 minutes. So maybe let me ask a 
question that combines the other two themes. I want you to also comment on what I'd asked Sabello, that we need to understand state capture as systemic looting, not merely inflating of invoicing. And that distinction is conceptually important. And whether we talk about the new age or whether we talk about SARS, I am grateful to Ethel Williams, not just as a South African brilliant whistleblower, but his book, which goes beyond his testimony, is absolutely brilliant, simple, without being simplistic in using Bain as a case study to help us understand how Bain literally groomed Sipo Maseko, and then from there also Tomoyane, to be able to then position itself to prey on the South African state in cahoots with board members and with CEOs who were willing to be corrupted in that corrupt nexus between private interests and citizens who've been seconded to the state by the ruling party invariably to be able to go and do the bidding of the Guptas. Speak into those case studies for me, particularly with a view to just teasing out the nature of state capture so that people can understand it's not fancy English. It is meant to be a different concept from corruption. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, you refer to the, the, the specific things and, and methodologies of state capture. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see the, the, the subsequent parts of the, the state capture report and how they how they produce that. Um, as I've said, I mean, the, the, the first three chapters of this of this first part are about specific uh, state entities, um, SOEs, that, that fourth chapter about public procurement then sort of takes a look at public procurement um, in the context of various different SOEs so that it can make, um, it, it, it is able to sort of represent kind of broader themes, common themes as to, 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 to how um, state capture was enacted. Um, but, and, and I think that, that uh, potentially, I mean, we don't have the executive summary yet. Uh, that will come out, I think, in the, in, the, in the third report. But I think that that is going to highlight um, and give us the the, the themes, the uh, the characteristics, as it were, um, that make uh, the state capture, but uh, state capture of a you know peculiar South African a South African type, um, and I think that that will obviously enrich uh, the, the the report's presentation. But I think the Bain um, example is such a is such a fascinating one, and I, I spoke about the sickening horror of, of of this report. But I think part of that sickening horror is the is the deep rank cynicism with which what some of these actors have have, um, um, have played their role and I speak particularly of an organization like Bain. I mean nobody when I say you know there is a particular flavor to this uh, South African flavor to the state capture no one should be under the impression that state capture is something that is endemic um, or specific to South Africans right and I think what we should be outraged and shocked at is the predatory nature of so all these supposedly blue chip, um, you know, international organizations that we're happy to at best sort of go along um, and, and, you know, seek to opportunistically benefit, but oftentimes sort to actually initiate the, the type of um, corruption and, and malfeasance we saw. And that is um, particularly true of Bain. So here is this Boston head, um, headquarter consultancy company, which says, oh, there's an opportunity for, um, you know, you know, to advise SOEs on um, transformation, and that's how we should hold ourselves out. And I mean, the question is, why would a, a Boston headquartered consultancy company have those particular skills? And it goes absolutely, and it preys on, on, on SARS, which is in fact a world class institution. And the report says again and again, it has been, it is held out as one of the kind of preeminent revenue collection services in the country, uh, in the world, from which global uh, revenue collection services can learn. And Bain goes on, not only, I mean, so here is where, here is where the, the malfeasance, the, um, the intent, the, the malign intent of, of Bain um, finds company with the malign intent of some political actors. Bain is there really to try and milk, um, you know, uh, restructuring of SARS for all it's worth. When, as you say, Ethel Williams makes it pointedly clear that an institution like SARS certainly need no, needed no sort of restructuring, certainly not the wholesale restructuring that Bain was selling and, uh, you know, then undertook. Um, but there was also that, um, that meeting up with, uh, with the political motivation 
uh, to, to break this institution, not only in order to gain as much money, but to break the institution in order to remove its competence, right? So You know, that's such an important say, point, Nicole, absolutely, yeah. We're going to see whether we can just also get the line a little bit clearer with Nicole, but the point that Nicole was making while we're fixing the line is so important. I want to say one or two things, and I want you to, to jump in from there. The first thing, Sabello, is as I'm listening to Nicole and I'm recalling my reading of absolutely brilliant book by Ethel Williams, which I will reread, and anyone who hasn't yet listened must listen to my interview with him. You can go to In the Ring with you, CBS McKaiser, my other platform where I'd interviewed him. Um, and the thing about Bain is here is a company that has the audacity of admitting that it's got no public sector experience. And yet it ends up writing effectively its own KPIs and therefore is the only one that can be hired after making a prospective CEO beholden to it by effectively, the analogy that I've used is quite callous, but unfortunately real, behaving like many tick peddlers on the Cape Flats, where they'll give the tick for free to Sabello. And once you are an addict, they start charging you premium and you then become a criminal needing your next fix and you will pay yeah. whatever needs to be paid to get it. So these guys go to Mauro's Arch they go to Bain's um, offices, and effectively, by the time it's day one as CEO or day one as commissioner, you come with Bain in tow. Yep. And what we haven't reckoned with as a country, even though investigative journalists like yourself, our colleagues, I remember many an article by Rob Rose, Financial Mail over the years, making this point at a high level and with a deep dive, You've effectively got a bureaucracy within a bureaucracy where management consulting firms, strategy consulting firms come in and they produce these massive decks. And I know it because I worked for one of them. And you make a killing hmm. off the South African public, even where you don't have the right kind of skills. To I mean, it's, it. it's sickening. And, yeah. and your article from 2018 that you shared this morning, which... In his brilliant book, I don't even think he, he he spends time on it because I read the book closely and I didn't even, I don't recall the example, is that Bain, Nicole Bain, was not only preying um, on Telcom where it perfected its technique that it then took to SARS, it also did so at South African Airways, Sabello. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the thing for me. And I mean, it, 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 it's almost like a mirror thing. So at SAA, um, Vuyani Chakana was announced as, you know, the CEO, um, I think sometime in 2000, 2017. Um, and what we did not know at the time was that when the announcement is made, he then begins going to Bain's offices as well. Um, it took him about, I think, three or four months for him to exit Vodacom um, and to then join SA. And the first people that he comes with, as you say, in tow, are none other than Bain consultants who are there to supposedly work for free, um, you know, in the CEO's office uh, without even a single memo being written anywhere, without anyone on the board knowing that there are these individuals inside the organization. Once they are there, the first thing they then suggest is that we need an organizational redesign here. Uh, the way that SAA functions simply doesn't work. And I think while I'm there, I'll pause and say that at that time, SAA had been awarded back-to-back on-time global awards. You know, so while the mess was right there at the top, the company itself was operating optimally and it, and, and it was one of the airlines that was most on time, you know, when it, you know, left and landed at destinations. But Bain in any way still figures that the organization needs to be rejigged. So then a tender is issued out of the CEO's office where the Bain officials are working. Um, and ultimately they want to appoint Bain, I think to the tune of about 139 million Rand. Never mind the fact that that specific tender was budgeted to be 8 million Rand. So it was more than tenfold what, you know, the value of the contract was that they stood to gain. And I think it's only because we started reporting on it, um, you know, that that plan ultimately fell flat. But for me, UCBS, it, 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 
it's in that, you know. And I think sometimes when you look at Bain, we only see the money that they've taken. And I think for me, it's the creation of, you know, that sort of deep state because it is sort of like a deep state. But no, it's more than that, that, right? So it's, it's the creation of the deep state. It's also literally hundreds of honest men and women being yeah. hounded out of jobs, now being unemployed. The president sheepishly yesterday saying thank you to the whistleblowers. Well, Ethel Williamson's life is ruined. The guy had to flee the country, scared for his exist for, for his personal well-being. You've got top people walking around with incredible skill and knowledge not employed yeah. because the private sector suddenly thinks, ooh, Nicole is bad news. We can't have her working for us. So yeah. we also have to talk, don't we, Nicole, about the human cost here. There's institutional cost and human cost, and the two are intertwined. We have lost revenue. There's opportunity cost with the lost revenue, things that we couldn't do in terms of yep. poverty alleviation, job creation, because that money can cannot be easily recovered. And in addition to that, you, you have the brain drain that was intentionally set up in order to make sure that the capacity to go after tax evaders has been completely destroyed. I don't even know, Nicole, how we begin to do a total cost to SA Inc. to try and summate the implications yeah. of what had happened. That's right, uh, Eusebius. I, I don't think that the total cost can ever be known. I mean, we can put, you know, uh, finance, uh, figures on on uh, the finances that were misappropriated. But as you say, the opportunity costs are never going to be known. Um, you know, the the human costs. Um, you know, what we might have been able to do. Um, the, the yeah, where we might be. Um, were it not for for what had happened. Um, that will that will be never never be known. It is. It is enormous, um, but as you say, and um, and I and I believe, you know, I agree with this entirely. I mean, somebody like Apple uh, Williams has uh, performed um, such a huge service uh, to the country. I think um, one of the very nice touches in the report that I saw was that they that they um, acknowledged how important um, Apple Williams' contribution in, in actually understanding the role of Bain. Um, it's its predatory nature, um, how brazen and incredible it was that it sought to play the role that, that, that it did um, and that it was able to take along um, those that it did um, in, in that process. Um, and, and yes, I mean, the fact that Apple Williams currently is sitting outside of this country is feels, um, you know, too scared to return. The fact that we have somebody like Babita Diakaran, who was the Department of Health um, official who was assassinated and we still don't have you know proper arrests um, and prosecutions there um, putting whistleblowers those who, uh, who you know on whose lives uh, have really been um, put at risk by making um, available the the information that we have um, and that has been so important for us to understand and hopefully heal and go forward um, as a uh, sustainable functioning democracy and, and, yeah and of course Abelo, there are others spent no more than one minute on this example even though it's actually more than i don't know it's it's a, it's a huge chunk of of the first part of the report but such is the detail we're going to have a couple more iterations of this conversation in the weeks to come i mean Tem temba maseko for example gets hounded out as dg of gcis because you have to position the boards so that they're able to do your bidding for every maluti kigupta or lynn brown knows that you manage to get on, you need to get rid of Temba. And for every Mzwanele Manye, who's a buffoon, happy to do your bidding, you get him on and you get rid of Temba. And this report is also important because it's a vindication of the honesty of those civil servants who get tainted with the same brush when we talk about how endemic corruption is within the state. One minute on that, because I want us to talk about where to from here. I mean, you see, because, I mean and, and I think it's you've laid it out great, you know, because when they got rid of Temba Masego, um, essentially that's when one would say that uh, the new age actually started because then they were able to siphon money, um, you know, out of there. 
And I mean, a lot of these guys are left around walking for a long time before they are trusted. Because again, another problem in South Africa is that not just the government, and you alluded to this, is that even the private sector uh, will see you as somewhat of a snitch if they know that you actually stood up um, for what is right. So the question that most of the public wanted us to deal with this hour, I decided was not the first question to ask because the detail mattered. But we're going to do it in the last 10 to 12 minutes. And then maybe in one of our next shows page, we can do this as the centerpiece question. So let's ask the question bluntly. Is anything going to happen? Will we see men and women behind bars with successful convictions? Will there be political consequence for political deployees? And in terms of the criminal justice system, are we going to see anything being done with the fact that had been uncovered? Because the commission was not a criminal body. It was quasi-legalistic, but it was essentially a fact-finding mission. And most people watching this live discussion between us, Sabello and Nicole, want to know why should we have faith that there will be consequences? Nicole? We'll get Nicole back in a second. So I think we've got you, Nicole. I mean, that's the dominant question. I mean, I'm reading the questions here at the bottom. And the theme running throughout them is skepticism in terms of sentiment and in terms of bold question. People want to know, are we really going to see justice? I mean, I do think that some of the recommendations that have been formulated um, are probably as detailed as, uh, as they can be. Um, so as I said, they, they name the specific individuals. They set out, um, set out the specific incidents in which they're implicated. And then they actually speak about the particular types of legislation under which charges should be brought. Um, and I think it would be, it, it would be very difficult um, to, uh, um, you know, for the National Prosecuting Authority not to move on those recommendations. That said, um, and it will be interesting to see in, in further volumes of the report, um, whether the National Prosecuting Authority is specifically looked at as an organization of state capture, because we know that it has been a, a, a locus of state capture and that it has been hollowed out, um, and that a number of the individuals who uh, were instrumental in the state capture there remain um, in situ. Um, and the question is, does the National Prosecuting Authority have the wherewithal then to, to move forward on these prosecutions? Certainly, I think that uh, what we've seen so far uh, in the recommendations is as much as we could have hoped for in terms of um, passing the baton to the National Prosecuting Authority and saying we now capacitated you with the information so that you can move with, uh, forward with these, with these prosecutions. And I think it capacitates us and, and uh, as the public um, to monitor the National Prosecuting Authority and not to be fobbed off with, oh, well, you know, investigations are Absolutely. ongoing. You know, these are the hmm. types of, um, you know, the evidence that we continue to, 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 to need to look for. Um, I think the public is in a much better position to say, well, you know, here the, the report has disclosed what is available. Um, there is, in fact, very little that you need to be waiting on in order to 100%. move forward with, with prosecutions. Hmm. And I think that but that is an important capacitation and empowerment of the public at large that mm. has happened, certainly as, as a result of this first um, volume. Nkosana Shongwe says, I have zero confidence in our justice system, Sabelo, from a skill set and will to prosecute. If anything goes, you know, if you look at the July unrest, it gave us a sense of where we are going with prosecutions in this country. It's such an on-point remark. You can't fault the skepticism of Nkosane's comment. It's how many months later, we still don't know actually what happened yeah. around Durban and around Jersey. Yeah. Intelligence structures were found wanting. We still don't have proper charges formulated. If such an event in the public glare can't be dealt with successfully, by the criminal justice system, what confidence should I have as Joe Soap, as Gogot Lamini, that these looters that are the main characters in these reports 
we'll see their come up and and I mean uh, the July unrest is one of it is all but the latest you see this I mean uh, we are still talking about digital vibes for instance um, where the SIU did what I think was absolutely great work you know they tracked money they showed you how the money was laundered and then they recommended that you know the NPA and law enforcement agencies investigate and take action um, it's been months now we've not heard anything and I'm saying in my view it's almost as if that was a ready case you know, they showed you how the laundering happened. They showed you where the money was, who the actors are. Um, they told you that they've got affidavits from people who are complicit in the laundering. Um, you know, telling you that I delivered cat bags of cash and I delivered boxes of cash to the minister's son. This was money that was taken from the state um, and nothing has happened. Can you really blame South Africans for, for actually thinking that, um, you know, nothing will result from this. And I think for me, in as much as we can admit that there are problems with the National Prosecuting Authority, um, you know, there are problems with, you know, the ID and all of these other, you know, instruments that were set up to fast track the prosecutions. Part of the problem here is a lack of political will. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because we now sit as, as citizens in this country, as journalists in this country, raising other issues that are, that are happening post what we call, you know, state capture, as if state capture has an, a beginning and an ending, um, you know, but in the new administration itself, you know, the president is very hesitant to sort of deal with problems that are now cropping up. The fact that the July unrest has not been resolved, and I mean, we're not even looking at the individuals, we just want to get a picture of what's happening. Yeah, and the fact that you don't even 100%. have that is a problem. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I suppose part of the, there's so many horrors. One can write an analysis piece about the multiple horrors to use the apt language of Nicole that comes out of this report. One of the horrors I think I was avoiding both as a moderator and as a citizen because I just can't deal with the horror so early in the morning, so early in the year, is the horror of us being at the mercy of ANC internal factionalism. Because if we are also honest, Sabello, the other determinant of whether anything will happen is that I don't have faith that ANC cadres who pretend that they can separate state from party are going to make honest decisions within the state about how to deal with the facts that are now on the table. I think a lot of the calculations will be what will be embarrassing for the ANC what will be good or bad for me in my bid to get re-elected at the end of this year if I wanted to be on an ANC's successful slate? And yet again, the question of justice um, is going to be deferred. I'll give you one or two minutes minutes each. Nicole, I, I don't know whether you are more optimistic, but it seems to me that it will probably be not to play Sangoma, justice deferred, unless miraculously, we see institutions like the NPA suddenly being fit for purpose, even though they themselves had been hollowed out. Uh, Eusebius, I, I mean, I think that that kind of uh, skepticism and, and anxiety is well placed, um, certainly on the basis of, of what we've seen and, and the fact that there have been so few um, prosecutions and successful prosecutions that have, have taken place. And so, you know, I don't think that we can read um, this particular uh, report in, in a vacuum. We will need to wait for the, for the subsequent, um, uh, the subsequent uh, volumes. As I said um, earlier, it will be interesting to see if there is a specific section on the criminal justice uh, system and the National Prosecuting Authority in particular, and what those recommendations are, because it's all very well um, you know, giving the National Prosecuting Authority, um, you know, the names of the pe persons, the the legislations, legislation under which they must be charged, and in fact, the evidence. But if there aren't persons within the NPA that are prepared to and able to move on that, um, that is going to come to naught. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, we have all, uh, you know, good reason. Um, to be sceptical about the NPA's ability to move on that. So we will need to see what those, what those recommendations are. But again, and, and I know I'm, I'm repeating myself here, but I do think that the, the report um, is vitally important in that it has placed us as the public in a much stronger position in order to be able to, to monitor 
um, and effectively um, oversee with real you know, knowledge now um, the, the progress of the National Prosecut Prosecuting Authority and to be able to call to account when those prosecutions are, are not right. forthcoming. Yeah. In addition, Nicole, speak to me about non-legalistic and non-adversarial justice interventions. And by that, I mean things like legislation that can be used to introduce greater transparency, for example, in the process of appointing a commissioner for SARS. So there's stuff that we can do outside of the criminal justice system that can also take us on a new path. Absolutely. And I think, you know, here the recommendations that were attached to the, the, the chapter on public procurement are, are very important. So um, it's not so much about, you know, prosecutions in respect of, you know, specific individuals, but there are recommendations going to, um, you know, new legislation that needs to be introduced, the establishment of an anti-corruption agency, what that would look like. Um, uh, you know, deferment of prosecution agreements in respect of private entities. Um, so those recommendations are, are really important and they go beyond sort of the, uh, you know, court trials. The other thing that I wanted to say, um, again, is that I think, uh, you know, in terms of capacitating the, the, the public, this information and the, the identification of private entities um, and obviously public entities and the role that they've played it, it puts us in a position um, as interested parties to call them to account. So, you know, for instance, there is the recommendation that uh, Standard, uh, Standard Bank um, and, and Nedbank um, look to uh, return uh, the monies that were, that, uh, were paid to, to regiments. Um, you know, those of us who are customers of the banks um, are absolutely in a position to, to call on Nedbank and Standard Bank to you know, do what is required in order to meet those recommendations. Um, again, with you know, whether it's McKinsey or Bain or PwC, uh, the naming and the identification of the role of those private entities makes it so much easier for us as a public to hold those those entities to account, to require them to answer, um, and to to respond in a way that is fitting and that goes beyond um, prosecution. Sabella, you're going to get my last question, which will set us up for one of the many other self-standing conversations we're going to have, which is the political ramifications of this. And um, I think it's fitting, given that we're talking about state capture, that I should end the discussion with some nepotism and take a question from my cousin. Um, <laughs> one of the questions my cousin has, Ruri, is about the political implications. Will this be the sort of final nail in the ANC's coffin. Um, you've been in the game for a long time, by which I don't mean to say that you are old. Um, what do you think the implications will be for, for the ANC of, of this report? Um, I'll give you one minute, um, and that will be our final comment for today. <laughs> sure. Look, um, it should be. Um, by all accounts, it should be. But I doubt it will be. You know, I mean, if we're realistic and we're honest with each other, I doubt it will be, but should be. And for me, I think the point that I also like to make, you see this, to what Nicole was saying, um, the recommendations on the legislation, it's important, yes, because that's the ultimate point of this whole thing, you know. But we need to worry now, and I think as citizens, we need to be active because these guys broke laws that already existed. You know, there were laws in place to prevent some of what they did. But the important thing is that is what we do with all of this information now going forward. Are we going to keep pressure on the president? Are we going to keep pressure on the NPA? Are we going to ensure that people are held accountable? Because clearly, if they are left to their own devices, nothing is going to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. First, I want to thank Nicole. Nicole Fritz is with the Helen Sussman Foundation. And I absolutely meant it. There are some institutions, um, whether it's freedom under law, whether it is the Helen Sussman Foundation, who do incredibly important work. Very often, their very specific legal arguments that they make as friends of the court carry the day or add a particular element that is crucial to helping us to repurpose institutions that had been bruised and battered. Uh, whether it's the Glenister judgment or whether it was aspects of making sure that the former president gets successfully jailed for 
um, criminalia and, and just not taking seriously the authority of the court. So I want to thank her for coming on and continue to do their work. Very often when I give keynote speeches, you want to know how can you help as corporate citizens give money to independent organizations that do oversight over the state and society, civil society organizations among them. I want to thank Sabelo Skiti, who is my colleague here at Arena Holdings at the Sunday Times, and um, the work that he does and other investigative journalists across the media. And then last but not least, please check out our work on timeslive.co.za and also on the Sunday Times website. We will continue to collate, to extract the data, to analyze it, to give you meaning, and uh, future episodes of Eusebius on Times Live. You can subscribe on whatever your favorite podcast platform is. Um, I will bring back, with their schedules permitting, the likes of Sabello and Nicole, and we will go to areas we couldn't get into. But for now, don't be fatigued by the detail. Empower yourself by reading, and at the very least, make sure that you follow and support excellent journalism because it is an important bulwark against the kind of corruption we are talking about. Nicole and Sabello, have a beautiful rest of the day. And th thanks so much for coming on the platform with me.